Epic Church, it is such a pleasure to be hanging out with you guys all the way from Baltimore, Maryland. Um, yeah, one person, is, okay, four or five, ten, okay, all right, awesome, thank you. Um, we don't say uh, Baltimore, we say Baltimore, um, so locally, um, that's what we say, but it's all good if you say Baltimore, it's all good. Um, it's, it's an honor, really, to be hanging out with you guys, uh, grateful to Pastor Ben. Um, for allowing me to be here, and I'm really, really just pumped uh, to be connected with um, Epic Church and what you guys are doing here and how you guys are supporting Hopeville and my family. Um, there's a picture of my family um, that we have on the screen. They didn't come with me. I, I brought one daughter with me that's, that's hanging out with Dad. Um, she's she's uh, my second oldest daughter, um, so hopefully she has a good time, uh, but uh, it is good to be with you guys today. Um, if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to meet me in James chapter number one um, on iPad or phone or whatever it is you use. Uh, we'll get there in just a moment. When I started thinking about uh, this series that you guys are in um, and that we are closing uh, today called Don't Shrink Back, um, my mind went to one of my favorite books that I've read over the last uh, several years. Uh, this woman by the name of Angela Duckworth, uh, who is a very gifted um, psychologist, and she put together uh, some work and put it in a book called Grit. And the subtitle of the book is The Power of Passion and Perseverance. And so in this book, uh, in chapter number four, there's a, a cool story that um, I, I want to share with you. There's, a, there's a, a guy by the name of Bob Mankoff. And uh, Bob is known as a phenomenal uh, artist and cartoonist. And the story goes that Bob was kind of meandering through his life. He was trying to figure out what to do. He had graduated from Syracuse University, went on to get a master's, um, and he was doing uh, some research. And he really wasn't loving it because deep down there was an artist in Bob. And he's like, man, I, I got to figure this out. So he found this book um, of a guy who was teaching people how to, to be a cartoonist, and, and he put together 27 uh, cartoons. And he decided he was going to uh, try to sell these cartoons to uh, a bunch of different magazines. And every single magazine that he went to with these 27 uh, cartoons rejected him. Can you imagine how demoralizing that is, especially for an artist? But there was uh, one uh, magazine that said, hey, Bob, listen, just keep at it. Like, do more cartoons. And Bob thought to himself, man, who can do more than 27 cartoons? Like, like that's, that's a lot. But there was something deep inside of Bob that wanted to keep trying. And he kept trying, and he kept trying, and he kept getting rejected, and kept getting rejected. As a matter of fact, Bob went on to say that before his first cartoon got printed in the New Yorker, he got rejected 2,000 times. 2,000 rejections. As a matter of fact, Bob said, I had more rejection slips uh, or enough rejection slips to actually wallpaper my entire bathroom. But something was going on with Bob for three years that he was getting rejected, producing cartoons after cartoon after cartoon. Bob didn't realize that he was being significantly shaped and formed through this process of rejection. It was like fertilizer that was helping Bob to grow. And as a matter of fact, it widened his perspective and narrowed his focus. He went on to research every single cartoon that had gotten printed in the New Yorker to help him figure out how to be better. And here's the thing. Bob didn't go on just to be a cartoonist. He later became the cartoon and humor editor of the New Yorker. But none of it would have happened without the adversity that Bob faced, and the rejections. I share that story with you because all of us have dealt with, are dealing with, or will deal with adversity. Some of us in this room can think right now of adversity that we're dealing with. Some of us are just coming out of, diverse, uh, of adversity, and some of us, unbeknownst to you, will be going into it at some point soon. And our natural response, our human response, is to sometimes shrink back. 
and to not keep going. Sometimes we quit or at least we feel like quitting. And even those of us who are followers of Jesus, the excrement hits the fan in our lives. Some of y'all will get that when you leave. <laughs> and we're throwing our hands up because sometimes it's confusing. I, I thought that following Jesus would make this thing better or, or I would just, just not deal with the things that I'm dealing with. And maybe there's some of you who are exploring your faith in Jesus, or you're maybe not necessarily a a follower of Jesus yet, but you'd like to consider yourself to be a good person. And so, hey, maybe you're a follower of Jesus. At at a minimum, you're, you're at least a good person. You're like, what the heck, man? Like, what is this? What am I supposed to do with what I'm experiencing? How am I supposed to handle it? I can't change it. I can't make it go away. And let me just make this personal for a second, because I think sometimes when you see people like me in in this position, and I know I'm I'm on the platform and I'm sharing, or you hear from Pastor Ben or others, um, and you think that we're further along, and maybe somehow that we're exempt to these kinds of things. No, no. I, I know exactly firsthand what this feels like. Let me just give you a couple of examples. I I moved my family to Baltimore. A new city I've never lived in before. I don't have any uh, community or, or people I know. And then COVID hits. Wish I had gotten an email ahead of time. I didn't get that email. So we deal with, with COVID and we come out of COVID and we had lost the church. And, and, and God gives a vision that, hey, you know what? We need to pivot the church in, in, in this specific direction to, to kind of move where he's going next and some key leaders on our team, there's this disagreement, and, and they leave. And, and then there are narratives that are popping up, and, and, and I can't uh, necessarily get ahead of them, those, those narratives or, or chase those rumors down or any of those things. I, I got to just, just take it because it's not wise for me to do that. Or how about this one? God says, okay, listen, I, I got something next for you. Uh, I want you to stay in the city, but, but I, want, I want you to move the family to a different part of the city. And so we put our house on the market by faith because we believe that this is what God is asking us to do. And, and literally several other houses in our neighborhood went on the market. And guess what? All those houses sold in, in days. And we still have a for sale sign out in front of our yard. I mean, that's just a small sample of just some adversity that I've, that I've had to deal with over the last several years and really intensely over the last 18 months. Now, it hasn't been all bad. There's been some, some great things and some awesome things that have happened. I just wish that the other things that have happened wouldn't have been so difficult. I, I wish there were some better answers for the adversity that I've been dealing with. There's this guy named James who wrote a letter. And this letter in the New Testament follows the letter that uh, we've just been uh, going through in, in, in Hebrews. And this guy, James, is the brother of Jesus. And he offers us some perspective that I want to share with us this weekend about what do we do when we're dealing with adversity? How do we, how do we handle this? So I'm going to read three verses for us in James chapter number one, starting in verse number two. Here we go. Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. I want to just put some money in the meter and just park right here for the, for the next several moments of our time. And I want to just tag this message, a very simple subject. Don't shrink back, but lean in. That's the encouragement today is to to lean in. This letter that is written by James, James is the brother of Jesus. And James, who is Jewish, is is writing to other uh, uh, Jews who are scattered abroad. And and he knows that that, that these uh, small faith communities are going to be uh, under attack and they're going to be facing a lot of different adversity, a lot of different things that they're going to be going through. And James dives right in after he says hello to everyone, and then he jumps right in in the second verse, and he's talking to them about uh, encouragement around uh, adversity. 
But it doesn't seem very logical. It doesn't even seem to make sense. Because our conditioning, our, our, our human tendency when we face adversity and trials or opposition, it's not joy. That's, that's usually not the first thing that pops up for us. And I can think of a couple of different examples in my life where I'm, I'm facing adversity. Like I, I was a former football player. And, and then I can tell you this, whenever our team uh, went down by several touchdowns, I, I, that, that didn't make me feel joy. Like I, I, I didn't, I, that wasn't the first thing that came to mind. My instinct when our van got stolen, when we moved to Baltimore twice in one month, like the first thing that popped in my head wasn't joy. When the police found the van twice, the first thing in my it wasn't joy. I mean, I'm just keeping it real with y'all. Like, I, maybe, maybe it's just me. So then the question that we really need to unpack here is, what in the world is James talking about? What does it mean to, to count it all joy when you face trials? What does it mean to let perseverance do its work. None of this seems to really make sense on the surface. But two things I think James is, is trying to get us to see that I want to leave with us this weekend. If you're taking notes, here, here's the first one. I think James wants to encourage us to change our perspective, particularly about trials or about adversity, or opposition that we face. But in order for us to do that, I think we need to to redefine or or, or have a different understanding of what it means to count it all joy. Like, what does joy mean? Well, James is not referring to happiness. Because in order for us to experience happiness, it means that we are having good things happening in our lives. But when he's talking about joy, he's talking about beyond the surface of of what's happening. So let's think about it like this. Um, We would love to have uh, just awesome things breaking out in our lives all the time, right? And as a result of that, those things make us happy and and they do bring us some, some joy. But instead I think James is really encouraging us to think of joy as like an anchor beneath the surface. And so the winds and the waves may may toss the boat, but but the anchor is keeping us steady. It's, It's helping us to feel secure. So we're not tossed to and fro by what's happening at the surface level of our life. But the problem is the definition of joy in our culture, is purely circumstantial. Now, I was an English major in college, and, and so I love words, and I love studying the etymology of words and, and looking up words. And, and when you look up the word joy, literally in Merriam-Webster dictionary, this is, this is what it says. The emotion evoked by well-being, success, good fortune, or the prospect of possessing what one desires or getting what I want. Awesome, right? But here's what Jesus told his disciples in John 15. And all James is doing is echoing what Jesus is teaching his disciples and teaching us. In John 15, Jesus says, I want you to have my joy. A complete joy, a joy that is predicated upon remaining connected to me. Why is this important? This is important because suffering is inevitable. Jesus knows that the disciples are really about to face something they've never faced before. He is going off of the scene. He's not going to be with them, and he's, he's telling them, hey, listen, I want you to have my joy, and the joy that I want you to have needs to be a joy that is connected to me. I want you to remain in me. Jesus goes on. In the next chapter in John 16, he says, you will suffer in this world. 
you will suffer. But be courageous. Don't shrink back. Why? Because I have overcome the world. So James isn't talking about happiness to us in this letter that he has written, but he's talking to us about hope, specifically hope in who our faith is in, Jesus. The other thing that James is saying is that the trials and the adversity that we face, there are opportunities to strengthen and to strengthen our resolve and our hope. He says, because the testing or the proving produces endurance. We've all been in situations and circumstances that when we look back upon it, they taught us something. They helped us see things differently. This is why adversity often leads to a deeper discovery and a deeper revelation. And it's for our benefit. It doesn't feel good when we're going through it. But afterwards, it is for our benefit. You know, um, I have uh, one son. I've got three daughters. And, and my son, Isaiah, man, he's an interesting guy. Love this guy. He's going to be nine um, soon. And, and uh, the other day, uh, speaking of adversity, um, I hear him going back and forth with his, with his younger sister my baby girl. And uh, they're arguing. And by the way, this picture of Isaiah that, that you see, he, he's not really happy here. He's a, he's a techie. You know, he doesn't like being outside. We're pulling weeds. And, you know, our church is a serving day for us. And he's ready to go home. But, but, but the other day, Isaiah, is, is he's going back and forth with his, with his younger sister. And, and, and so I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. And, and upon further investigation, Isaiah's really not upset with his sister about whatever it is that, that they're arguing about. He's frustrated because his computer isn't working. That's why he's upset. And so I find out what's going on, and he gets emotional. And I, and I said, Isaiah, why didn't you bring the computer to me? He looked me square in the eyes and said, Dad, there's nothing you can do. <laughs> and I was offended. <laughs> and so I said, Isaiah, and I had to remind him that he's experiencing what he calls adversity. I'm, I'm like, son, it's going to get a lot worse in life, but let's, <laughs> let's, let's deal with this computer. <laughs> but he, he, he's, he's dealing with this, this adversity uh, with, with this computer not, not working. And so, so I, I had to remind him. I said, I, Isaiah, at least two different times recently, we've had a similar situation, and I have helped you. I've, I've, I've been there for you. So I demanded he give me the computer, and he did, and I helped him to fix it. And it hopefully will become a reminder to him. And, and what I'm trying to share with you is that we don't have to walk around with this, this adversity that we're carrying in and feel like there's nothing that, that can't be done or that there's a God that's disconnected from us who doesn't care what we're going through. He's there to help us and to support us. James is not asking us to ignore the things that we're going through, but instead it's an invitation to us that, that there's something on the other side of it that is actually there to produce something in our lives. So the first thing that James is, is trying to get us to see, I think, is to change our perspective about specifically the trials in our lives. The second thing that I think James wants to share with us is, or reveal to us, is that we should let the adversity that we are facing, the trial, the opposition, complete the process. Like we should allow it to, to, to do what it does. Because we better understand it, 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 is, it, is, it, is, it has a purpose in our lives. And he says we need to, to let endurance, because this is what the adversity is doing, it's producing endurance in us, let it have its full effect. Why? So that we can be mature, we can be complete, and we can lack nothing. We love throwing out sayings like trust the process, 
when we're not in the process. It's easy to say that to someone else. But this is what basically James is saying, to trust the process. Typically, our response is, I want to get out of the process as quickly as possible. Like, I need this to be over. But if we do that, it doesn't, it doesn't allow us to experience or grow to the maturity on the other side of it. When I found out I was coming uh, to, to speak to you guys, um, man, I was super excited. Um, my daughter, Jocelyn, who's with me, she's a senior, uh, a rising senior in high school, and I thought it'd be just a good opportunity for us to, to come out and hang out together and and um, one of the things that we're going to do while we're here, we'll be here for a few days, is we're going to see some redwoods. And we've, we've never seen them before. And um, I have a friend of mine back in Maryland who owns a, like a 100-plus acre farm, and he's been teaching me about trees. And so the last like, couple of years, he's been talking to me about roots and soils and, and different types of trees and all these sorts of things. So I've been really kind of nerding out and getting into it. And so uh, I started uh, doing a little bit of, of research. And, and I'm probably going to tell you guys something that you already know, so just, just, just flow with me for a little bit, all right? So uh, redwoods are, you know, they're part of, uh, of what's called the giant sequoias. And when I was doing a little bit of research, I, I found out this fascinating thing that giant sequoias, they cannot survive, or I take that back, they cannot thrive without fire. And this is a, a fascinating thing to me. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about... Um, wildfires or these high severity fires. But here's the thing that happens with these fires. The fires serve two main purposes. Number one is um, when the fires burn, they actually clear out areas so more light can, can come in and specifically shine on the, the smaller, younger trees so that they could grow to maturity. So that, that's, that's the first part of the fire. The second part of the fire is, is it actually helps the pine cones to open up and release the seeds that are inside of them. And then when the seeds are released, they go into the ground, and the ground now has a layer of ash, which then helps the, the soil to become richer for when the seed goes in it. It's a natural adverse process that's intended to help the trees grow. Not having regular fires is a bad thing. Just like not having regular adversity in our life is not a good thing for us because it helps us grow. So the adversity that we experience, the adversity that we are experiencing right now, the trials, it is there to produce something in us. There's something that God desires to be produced in our lives that will never come to fruition if we don't go through trials. If you don't believe me, we can just hit the rewind button back to Hebrews chapter 11 and all those people's names that are listed in Hebrews 11, which we call the hall of faith, and we celebrate them, but each one of them, significant trials and adversity in their life. Adversity is also not just helpful for us individually, it's helpful for us collectively. Because here's the thing, when we individually experience a trial and we go through something, it becomes not only rich, uh, a rich soil and experience for us, but for others as well to share with them and to help them to overcome or to push through. This is what it means to let the endurance have its full effect. But how do we do that? How do we let endurance have its full effect? How do we do what James is asking us to do? Well, back to John chapter number 15, Jesus said nine different times, Remain in me. I think he's trying to make a point. Whenever my mother repeated something, that meant something important. And I hope it didn't take her nine times or I was really in trouble. But he said, he, he's, he's imploring the disciples 
to stay connected to me, to lean in. Don't shrink back. Why? He says, because apart from me, you can do nothing. That sounds crazy. What do you mean, Jesus, apart from me, I can do nothing? He's not talking about activity in our lives. He's talking about being fruitful, specifically the fruit of the Spirit. And oh, by the way, do you know that one of the fruit of the Spirit is perseverance. I know that's not the sexy fruit. You know, we love the love, we love love, joy, peace. You know, we like, no, perseverance is a fruit of the Spirit. And Jesus is saying that cannot be produced in your life without staying connected to me. In Hebrews chapter number 10, which you would have touched on in this series, in verses 21, 22, and 23, there's a reminder that Jesus is our high priest, and we should draw near to him and to hold on to the hope that we have in him. And hope is not something that we grab one time and we, we put into our pocket or, or a cup that we just fill one time. It has to keep getting filled over and over again. It would be also like going to the gym. If you want to get stronger and you want to live a healthy life, you don't just go to the gym uh, a couple of months or uh, irregularly or a couple of times a year. No, you have to keep going and going and going and going. This is what James is saying to us that we have to complete the process. Let me see if I can land the plane for us like this. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Parker Palmer. Uh, he is a writer. He's a philosopher. And a lot of his work has been influenced by the Religious Society of Friends. Um, that is uh, a group that we may know of as the Quakers. And he wrote this little book called Let Your Life Speak. And towards the end of the book, he's talking about how our life is really played out in cycles. And the cycles are really related to seasons. And so he's talking about spring and summer and, and fall and winter. And when I read the book earlier this year for the first time, the season that I really gravitated to the most was winter. Because I've been really experiencing a lot of trials. And if you are a person who started something from scratch or you're an entrepreneur or uh, something to that effect, um, you know how challenging that can be. Or uh, you're trying to do something in a new place or starting over. Or you're trying to develop a new community. Like all of those things are really challenging. And so when I'm, when I'm thinking about James's words, I'm thinking about what Parker Palmer is, is talking about as it relates to winter. Because adversity and trials, when they are prolonged, it's like winter, and maybe you guys don't have winter like we have winter on the East Coast. You get to the point, you're like, dude, this needs to be over. <laughs> but winter is a demanding season, and he says not everyone appreciates its discipline. But the rigors of winter are accompanied by amazing gifts. And one of those gifts is clarity. When the leaves have fallen, you can see further and further than you would during spring or during summer. And we, we love those times, but, but there's a certain kind of clarity that we get in winter. There's a certain kind of clarity that we can get in our lives when we're, when we're going through things that are, that are struggle for us. It can provide a sense of clarity for us. And I can tell you, in this winter season for me, clarity for me is I need to lead better. I, I'm deficient in this area of my discipleship and following Jesus. I wouldn't have gotten that clarity without the adversity. But sometimes what happens when we are experiencing this, our tendency is to want to be where it's comfortable or to be where it's warm or to be insulated. And Parker Palmer says that the winters will drive you crazy unless you learn to do one thing, lean into them. Or get into them. You literally get out of where it's comfortable and get into it. And this is what he says. Until we enter boldly into the adversity or whatever it is that we are experiencing or what we want to most avoid, 
these feelings of, of frustration or anxiety or whatever it is will dominate our lives. But when we walk directly into them, protected from the frostbite by the warm garb of friendship or inner discipline or spiritual guidance, we can learn from what the winter or the adversity has to teach us. Here's the encouragement from James. Lean in. Don't shrink back. And there's an encouragement that we can find in knowing that Jesus, our high priest, is with us in the middle of it. And that there's purpose in our adversity. There's there's purpose in it to draw us closer to Jesus and to mature us. And on the other side of it is maturity and completeness and lacking nothing. But if we stop short of leaning in and we shrink back, we never reach our full potential or what God desires for us. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for just this opportunity that you've given to us today to remind us that you don't want us to shrink back, that you want us to lean in, and specifically to lean in and be connected to you. Help us to realize that when James says that we should count it all joy in our lives, it it doesn't mean that everything that's happening is cool. But we can have an anchor that is holding us steady, regardless of what's happening on the surface, tossing us to and fro. But God, we, we need you. We need you to help us to stay grounded. And whoever in this room today is maybe in a situation that they would identify as adversity, will you let them feel encouraged today? Will you let them feel seen today? Will you let them leave here today, as you said, being courageous because you have overcome the world? And if there's someone here today who hasn't put their faith in you yet, still deciding whether they are going to do that or not, Lord, I I pray that you would just speak to their heart and let this be an opportunity to make the best connection that could ever be made. Because you desire for us to live full and fruitful lives. Help us to lean in and not shrink back. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we're going to have a time of of worship and reflection. We'll have a team here ready to pray for you and with you. And I don't know what you came in here with today. I don't know what adversity you may be carrying or processing. But you don't have to leave here today weighed down with it. It doesn't mean that It's going to go away immediately or it's going to be resolved. But my hope is that you leave here today encouraged and that you make the decision to not shrink back, but to lean in. Let's worship and pray together.